So we have U.S. warplanes ready to fight. To fight. Gentlemen, the uh, Andrews sisters hopefully took you down uh, memory lane a little bit, and ladies as well. Now we have to maintain some extra decorum as we've got some uh, warplanes that we're going to take a look at for about two minutes here. Hopefully a little trip down memory lane there. And uh, I'd open this up real quickly to gentlemen or ladies. Uh, can you comment about the paintings on the planes? Was this common, it appears? Were these anomalies? And what type of morale did this serve? Any gentlemen or ladies care to comment on this? There was a lot of them. A lot of the planes were painted. OK, and can you kind of tell us, were they, were they done per the unit? What, what would go into getting that particular? That was probably for morale, but with a bunch of guys, it's probably the guys just building their own morale up. Okay. And yeah, we've certainly seen these. I've seen these many times. It's always interesting to see this, well, first of all, put to music. And one of the things I try to do in my classes all the time is to bring in the music of the era. Because music is always such a part of history. And particularly with history, we tend to get a little bit war sighted understanding that despite the complete mobilization of the war, there was certainly much more going on. Nope, oh, looks like we've got a... George, I might need your technical expertise again. As we seem to be does not want to advance either on the... Now usually in class I just curse at it and it tends to work, but... Uh... No trick. Thank you very much. Okay, so we know of course on December 7th, fateful day, that indeed the attack would come. Before we see a short little clip of this, 359 planes. And Ed did a real nice uh, journal. Our students are all doing a variety of journals or investigative topics on the different planes. And Ed, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Say a few words about the Japanese Zero, if you would, please. Okay. Just maybe introduce this to some of our audience. Uh, well, the Japanese actually in Pearl Harbor, what they were using were the uh, Type Zero A6M. Um, zeros, they were actually replacing for the 96 types were the predecessors. Pearl Harbor was actually the only second time that the Japanese have ever used the zero. First time was in China, and that was still when it was a prototype, so Pearl Harbor was the very first major test, but even the Japanese weren't too impressed with the victory because all they were doing was shooting down park planes and, and, and park boats, so they weren't really impressed with the results. Um, it wasn't until was it the Philippines that they were really Test zero. So. Thank you. And I know students, they, they just despise being put on the spot like this. But it's just too much fun to resist. It really is. So we look at the ships. And really, we're talking about the carriers, the various carriers that would take the planes to launch on there. Uh, the submarines and, of course, the aerial torpedoes. There were three waves. Actually, there were three waves to this attack. And the third one was called off. So two waves would indeed strike. And we fairly well know the damage in the evidence. We're not going to go through that. But I've got a real nice short little clip here, which should, should introduce you to a couple of things, hopefully, that you've not been aware of. Yeah. 
for these film crews for propaganda purposes not only crippled America's Pacific fleet, it changed the course of history. Just the day before the rain, President Roosevelt had personally appealed to Emperor Hirohito not to drag their two countries into war. It was too late. Japan had formed a secret pact with Germany to attack the Allied forces in Europe and in the Far East. America at that stage was neutral, but generally sympathetic to the Allied cause. This was an attempt to destroy American military power in the Pacific before she could strike back. As Senator Connolly, Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, made abundantly plain. With unbelievable treachery and craftiness, Japan has attacked our territory and murdered American citizens. Japan began this war in treachery. We shall end it in victory. Within hours of the Pearl Harbor raid, American Army and Navy officers were called from their homes and weekend golf clubs to meet at the War Department to prepare to retaliate. President Roosevelt officially informed Congress that a state of war now existed between the United States and Japan. Within hours, Congress gave him the authority to prosecute the conflict all out. The legacy of the raid was enormous. Five American battleships were sunk or damaged beyond repair. 200 aircraft were destroyed and more than 2,400 people killed. But more than that, Pearl Harbor led directly to what truly became the... And the first student that asked me, how many professors does it take to run a computer? <laughs> I hate it when they're right. Yeah, clearly, so it's things that you know about. I want to po pose one question to you. Yeah, there's no getting around what took place on Pearl Harbor. Certainly a sneak attack, a planned attack, however we want to call it. Uh, we'll look, take a look at the uh, casual reports. Anybody know the name Kanaka Mali? Who were the Kanaka Mali people? They were indigenous Hawaiians. They were the indigenous Hawaiians to this, to this territory. Did they ask for this war? Was Japan at war with them? Not likely. Think of the, uh, you know, maybe the ethics of the United States moving their naval base to a country that brings war to this country. Uh, most of you guys are probably familiar with a movie uh, about eight, nine years ago, Pearl Harbor, a wonderful American film starring Ben Affleck. How can we put forth a film that doesn't even mention the indigenous inhabitants of the island? Just like I say, I think one of the forgotten things of this particular struggle is that you had thousands of indigenous Kanaka Maui people that were affected by this, and seemingly history has passed them by.